Okay. Well, let's bow our heads and our hearts. Lord, you are wonderful. And uh, Lord, we pour our hearts to you. We are thankful to you, Lord, for all that you've done. Thank you so much, Lord, that, uh, that you have given your life, you have poured out your life for us. And Lord, we have redemption through all that you have done for us. And truly, Lord, uh, through the redemption that you have provided to us, the giving of your Holy Spirit, we can, we can cry out to you, Lord. We can cry out, Abba, Father, and, and declare that you are wonderful. Uh, without such, Lord, we would never do that. We would be self-serving and after our flesh and, uh, Lord, never be seeking the things of you and never be in a communion service where we'd be giving thanks to you for what you've done. So we give you, give you thanks in advance, Lord, for all that you have done for us and pray, Lord, that you would just bless us and with your presence here tonight. And, Lord, that we'd be touched to our very core. Remembering all that you have done for us and the hope, the peace, the joy that we have in you. So just go before us now, Lord, as we turn to your word and explore uh, some of the things that you have said to us. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are going to start in Galatians chapter 1. Read the first, um, first five verses. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, just picking this apart a little bit, and uh, this is an open, open uh, book quiz, and the answers are right there in the first five verses, and they're in order. <laughs> <laughs> Grace from who? God. God the and? Our and our Lord Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He gave himself for our sins. Why did he do that? He would deliver us from this present evil age. And for what purpose? To, to fulfill the will of God. Amen? So, and he says, uh, he ends that with the opening there with, to him be the glory forever and ever. So, just... A little something, a little side note. How long is forever? Long time. <laughs> forever. How long is forever? Never, never ends. So what is forever and ever? Longer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just thought that was interesting because we say that all the time, forever and ever. It's forever and, <laughs> and ever. <laughs> forever and ever. So... So grace is from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins so that he could deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Um, so it's God's will, obviously, is what he's saying there. It's God's will to deliver us from this present evil age. And he accomplished that by giving himself for our sins. To deliver us from this present evil age. That seems to make, I don't know, but that hits home closer more and more each and every day, it seems, right? I mean, every time you open up the, up the news, it's just like, I mean, for years, I think it can't get worse. It can't get worse. It can't get worse. And every day it does. And, and it's escalating. You know, the, this present evil age is even more evil every day, every moment. I mean, these these. They're having a conniption fit over this brief that was leaked. You know? Why? Because we won't be able to kill our babies. I don't know. It's this present evil age. But it's God's, God's will to deliver us from this present evil age. Um, so we're going to be looking a little bit at God's will. 
And we're going to be looking at hope, some of the hope that's offered to us through his will, the peace that's offered to us. But uh, so let's look at a couple of things here. We know some things uh, about God's will from the scriptures, right? I don't know if we know everything, but we know some things. Um, and if you remember, um, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. And he said, well, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed by thee, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, both now and forever and ever. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, so, um... So he, he taught them to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So our prayer is that, God, your will be done. Now, I just, I want to think about that for a second. Now, when the disciples asked him to teach us to pray, and he taught them to pray those words specifically, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, what do you think, how they would have taken that if they had the foreknowledge that he had? That he's going to accomplish his will through the shedding of his blood, the giving of himself. Thy will be done. You're going to be tortured. You're going to be slandered. There's going to be a conspiracy against you. They're going to arrest you. They're going to hold illegal trials against you. They're going to convict you. They're going to pull out your hair and your beard. They're going to beat you. They're going to shred your back to a pulp. They're going to mock you. They're going to force you down a road and nail you on the cross to the most horrific death that you could possibly imagine. And in the process you're going to be separated from your father. Thy will be done. Now, they might have wanted to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. I mean, because that's a pretty, you know, it's, I think sometimes if we know what his will is in advance, it might be a little scary for us and we might have a little more trouble with saying those words. Thy will be done. But that's the truth, isn't it? We want his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we also know from Jesus' prayer that he wasn't just saying those things. He wasn't just saying, here's how you pray, thy will be done. He went to the prayer in the garden and he said, if there is any other way, Lord, let this cup pass from me but not my will be done your will be done and then all those things proceeded to happen to him why so that he might deliver us from this present evil age he afforded us eternal life through that same act which is more important, isn't it? But nonetheless, he did it also that he might deliver us from this present evil age. So what else do we know about God's will being done in the scriptures? Um, I'll just read to you a one before we turn to Ephesians. Um, but in 1 Thessalonians, very directly, he says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. God's will for us is that we would live holy lives, sanctified lives not sexually immoral, immoral lives. But we see from this particular text that that requires some of our own cooperation, doesn't it? 
his will in this particular case. He says, my, well, my will for you is that you would abstain from these things, that you wouldn't do these things. But we can reject his will, can't we? We can do things that, he, that are his will for us. We can still do those. So to some extent, that takes cooperation on our part, willingness, obedience, cooperation on our part to him to see that his will is worked out in our lives for our good, by the way. Um, and in, in addition to that, he's given us the Holy Spirit to empower us to obey, right? So we're not left like, oh, here you go. Good luck with that. Um, he's given us his Holy Spirit that we would have the empowerment to cooperate. But what I want to look at now is what is God's will that is independent of our actions? What is his will which provides a clear definition of who he is, what his character is? And for that, we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to pick it up in, uh, sorry, verse 3. And we're going to read through verse 14. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have attained, obtained an inheritance, being pres predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So since all this was initiated by God before the foundation of the world, before we ever came into physical being, being certainly we had nothing to do with the exercising of his will. Right? Mm -hmm. We weren't even here. <laughs> so this part did not require our cooperation. This is God's will being worked out on our behalf unilaterally. Right? So... The unilateral exercise of God's will. We're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We're chosen before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless. We're predestined to be adopted by him. We're accepted. We're redeemed. We're forgiven of our sins. He has given to us a revelation of the mystery of his will. We are heirs of his kingdom, and we've been sealed with his Holy Spirit as a promise of that inheritance. That's all he did. Had nothing to do with us. We had no part in any of that. Well, let's continue on. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 2. Starting in verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God 
who was rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before, beforehand that we should walk in them. So here it continues. We've been made alive. We've been raised up. And why? That he may reveal the exceeding riches of his grace in Christ Jesus. That doesn't even make sense. He did all that so that he could show us the kindness and the exceeding riches of his grace in Christ Jesus for the ages to come. Th that's just astounding. That's just an amazing God, is it not? And, and here's a, a side note, something I was thinking about. For the ages to come, and we already said forever. How long is forever? Forever. Forever. Both directions, right? It's not just forever, you know, into the future. It's forever into the past. It's forever. Forever. Well, how far is the ages to come? Forever. Forever and ever and ever. And, and he did this and he chose us before the foundations of the world. Before, before this world even existed, he did that. Now, we can kind of put a time stamp on that one, right? We can go back how long? Maybe about 6,000 years, right? So we can go back about 6,000 years and we can say, okay, so for, he chose me before at least 6,000 years, right? Chose you, all you, before 6,000 years, you know, somewhere before that. Now, this is what kind of baffles me a little bit. Forever's forever, and forever's forever in both directions. 6,000 years ago, God chose to create this world. What did he do before that? What did he do for the eons and eons and the timeless past before that? What was he doing? You can imagine he was creating. Would you not? Do you think he was just sitting there for, for forever? <laughs> I wonder what I should do. <laughs> he was doing things. And so here's the thing. When, when you think about him revealing the grace and his kindness forever for the ages to come, can you imagine what that's going to be like? what it's going to be like for the things that he did prior to the foundation of the world and after this world is gone and there's a new world. I mean, forever and ever, the things that he hasn't done yet, forever for the things that he did forever before. <laughs> it's, it's just it's an astounding thought. For the ages to come, he is going to reveal to us the grace and his kindness in Christ Jesus and all that he has done forever. That's just amazing. And in that, we ought to find great hope. Should we not? Mm -hmm. Should we not find great hope in that? I mean, you think about comparing that to this present evil age. They're really incomparable, are they not? And we've talked about this before. You know, Peter... First Peter, in verse 1, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, right, to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So he's begotten us to this living hope, which we have defined in the biblical way as that confident expectation of what's going to come, right? But I want you to recall back to Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 10 where it said, we are his workmanship. His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are literally his poem. That's what workmanship means. We're his poem. We're his story. His workmanship that he created 
to perform his good works. We can't take credit for the good works. They're his good works. His good works, not our good works, because our works aren't good. They're not good enough. Our works aren't good. They're his good works. And let me tell you, it turns out that being created by him for good works, works that are his, that's actually a good thing. That's a really good thing, right? Yeah. So when we were up in Ohio, we were reading a devotion in the morning um, by Paul Tripp, uh, his devotion called New Morning Mercies. And on April 21st, we read this particular um, devotion. It says, you obey not to get God's attention, but because you have been the object of his attention since before the world began. We don't obey him to get his attention. We obey him because of the attention that he gave us. Your obedience is never to be done in the hope that you will get something. That's the worldly hope, not his hope. We don't obey him. We, our obedience is never to be done in hope that you will get something, but rather in recognition of what you have already been given. So here's the humbling and comforting truth of the gospel. Your obedience doesn't initiate anything. Your obedience and mine only occur because God initiated a redemptive process that resulted in our forgiveness and transformation. We don't obey to get his favor. We obey because his favor has fallen on us and transformed our hearts, giving us the willingness and the power to obey. God's work of rescue and forgiveness didn't begin just before you first believed. It didn't begin just before you were born. It began before the world was born. He placed his grace on you and wrote your story in such a way that a, at a certain point in time, you would hear the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ and believe. His love for you is never a result of your character. It is a clear demonstration of his. He granted you and me what we never could deserve. Our new life is his choice, his gift. This means that if you obey him for a thousand years, you will have no more of his favor than when you first believed. Now that is grace. That is great, abundant grace. So when we were reading that, it struck me that the biblical definition of hope is that confident expectation of things to come. And I knew that that worldly hope was empty. It was that, well, I hope so. Yeah, I, I had no confidence. I, I, I kind of hope that that's going to happen, but I don't really know that that's going to happen. But I, I really, for some reason, never could put my fingerprint on why that was. And I think this did a really good job of explaining it because our hope in him is based on what he did. And what he did in his will will be done. And so we have a great confidence in that. And the reason I, I emphasize that scripture about we are his, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared beforehand, the good works that we work in him are according to his will. Our own works is merely an attempt to find favor in his sight, which will never, ever amount to anything. In fact, most of the time, they fall short or they don't meet our own expectations. And so because of that, that kind of leaves my hope a little empty, right? And so I, this, this comparison between biblical hope and worldly hope is that our biblical hope is based on what is definite, it's a confident expectation. It will happen where our worldly hope 
is a complete maybe, and a lot of times based on failure. That will, is not, we're not confident it will happen, right? We can do our best to try to make that happen, but there could be a whole lot of factors that come into play that never ever, you know, that never comes to fruition. Um, so anyway, I say that because, um, you know, th this hope that we have is based on that, what he, he did for us. And we have a confident expectation that our hope will come true. Romans says in Romans 5, chapter 1, or 5, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God because we have been justified by faith. He gave that to us. That was a gift that he gave to us. This grace gift that he gave to us. A confident hope that we can rejoice in. So tonight, we're going to spend the last part of this service communing with our Lord through the life that he gave willingly gave for us that we might not only have eternal life but that we might be redeemed from this present evil age that's why we're here and so we want to celebrate the communion celebrate he said when you do this as often as you do it do it in remembrance of me can we not come rejoicing? We might be dealing with things that we need to repent of, and certainly we need to do that. But when we come, we shouldn't come in defeat. We should come in victory. We come in victory, a victory that he won, a hope that he gave us works that were created in him for us individually to perform good works that he created beforehand for us. We can come in victory, not in defeat, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. And so what we want to do tonight is we want to focus on what he did, not on our failures, because there's no hope in that. We want to focus on what he did, the confident expectation of what is to come. And I think if we do that, we will find that our empty hope, our empty worldly hope, will be transformed into a confident expectation, which is worth rejoicing over. Amen? Amen. So we're going to dim the lights and we're going to turn some music on, I assume. And, and then uh, we'll just spend the last 15 minutes or so in communion. Amen. Lord, help us as we spend this time and set this time aside. Lord, to rejoice in you and all that you have done for us. Lord, touch our hearts. Draw us near. Lord, we, we need to be drawn near. And Lord, we, we want to come rejoicing and not so caught up on the things of this world, that this present evil age, and certainly many, many things that we all carry and are concerned over. Lord, help us not to, not to have them so far in the forefront of our minds that, Lord, we forget to rejoice in the glory of God and what you have done for us and the hope that we have in you. Just calm our hearts. Lord, calm our hearts to know that, that your will will be done. And Lord, there is a forever and ever that we have our confident expectation that we have to spend with you for the ages to come, Lord, that you're going to reveal to us things inconceivable, the grace and the kindness in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Bless us now as we turn to you in your precious name. Amen.